morning. Uh, I'm Steve Babich, head of the AI portfolio. Uh, along with me is Krista Kennard. She's an AI lead in the AI portfolio and a director in the AI Center of Excellence in the Technology Transformation Service. As you know, we run the AI community of practice and we're glad you all can join us today. Uh, we've got a really important event. So again, thanks for joining. We've got uh, today experts from uh, NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology who will provide an overview of some of their key artificial intelligence initiatives, including responsible, trustworthy, and explainable AI, AI but I'll let them get into that in more detail. Uh, and specifically, our experts are, uh, first is Elham Tabassi. She is Chief of Staff in the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. ITL, one of six research laboratories within NIST, supports their mission to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology in ways that enhance economic security, improve our quality of life. ITL conducts fundamental and applied research in computer science and engineering, mathematics and statistics that cultivates trust in information technology and metrology by developing and disseminating standards, measurements and testing of interoperability, security, usability and reliability of information uh, systems. So welcome Elham, great to have you. Additionally, our other expert uh, from NIST is Mark Prisbaki. He is acting chief of the Information Access Division in NIST, one of seven technical divisions in the ITL at NIST. In this capacity, he leads NIST collaborations with industry, academia, and other government agencies to foster trust in emerging technologies that make sense of complex human information by developing improvements to the measurement science, managing technical evaluations, and contributing to standards. The IAD is home to the High Profile Text Retrieval Conference, TREC, several biometric benchmarking programs, and a growing number of technical evaluations for emerging human language, natural language processing, and speech, image, and video analytics technologies. Mr. Przbaki currently, his current interests are in AI benchmarking, explainable AI, and bias across the AI development life cycle. So welcome, Mark, as well. Thanks for, for, uh, for joining. So certainly we're excited to have you both. These are certainly uh, topics that are, that are of high interest across the federal government ecosystem and to a number of stakeholders. Uh, Elham and Mark, you'll provide us an overview of their work. Uh, and following that, we'll, uh, we'll certainly make time for Q&A and Krista and I can manage that. And, and as Alex said, please do feel free to drop your questions in the chat at any point in time, and then we'll make sure to cover those. So uh, with that said, I guess I will turn it over to you, Elham, and let you begin. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for having us here. And we're pleased to be here and talk about NIST AI program. Um, and I am, okay, very good. Uh, so a few words about NIST or National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm sure many of you are familiar with NIST, but NIST uh, or uh, previously NBS, National Bureau of Standards, was put in charge of the development and custodian of national standards. At that time, United States had few national standards and it was difficult for Americans to conduct fair transactions to get parts to fit together properly. Uh, example of that is the fire at the Baltimore City and this was um, developed on uh, or, or put together in, on uh, 1901. Uh, uh, Congress uh, charted the creation of the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, today, NIST is home to five Nobel Prize winners and has a broad portfolio of research and AI is certainly a strategic priority for NIST. Um, as Steve said, I am with Information Technology Laboratory, one of the six research lab at uh, NIST and our purpose is cultivating trust in IT and technology. ITL cultivates trust in IT and metrology by using its uh, measurement and testing resources, uh, uh, which encompass a wide range of areas of computer science, mathematics, statistics, system engineering, and we also have uh, psychologists and cognitive scientists on board. Uh, the uh, area or spectrum of work goes from fundamental research all the way to adoption. So we work on the uh, uh, scientific underpinning of the technology. Uh, we also work with uh, scientists for applied research, how to get that fundamental research into the applied. 
We work with the different uh, standard development organizations and contribute towards a development of technically sound and uh, uh, fit for purpose uh, standard and best practice guides. And we also develop guides and work with industry very closely to make sure that uh, those standards and best practices uh, are being adopted. Uh, and that is exactly what we're also doing, doing in the area of AI. In the area of AI, NIST develops tools and measurement uh, to understand the capabilities and limitations of artificial intelligence technology. We work with the AI community to establish rec technical requirement needed to cultivate the trust that AI systems are accurate, reliable, safe and secure, explainable and free from bias. Um, and, and that is uh, a very important topic these days because uh, while there has been major advances in artificial intelligence, depends on the uh, link uh, that you click on or the article that you pick up, uh, it either talk about uh, how great AI is and uh, how it can raise productivity, productivity and enable more efficient use of resources and basically it's gonna uh, change our life uh, for better uh, and there are some that has that talk about the negative impact uh, on humanity, on job, and uh, and some even talk about a threat to humanity. And the truth is really in between. And that is really what we are trying to do uh, with our focus on uh, fundamental and applied research and standards for AI technology, uh, uh, just like uh, any other. A program just like this, uh, the spectrum of the work in ITL uh, for the AI or work goes from uh, fundamental to apply to development of standards all the way to adoption of responsible, safe and secure AI technologies. Oh, sorry. Um, so what are, uh, what are our uh, program? What are the components of our program? And I will be talking a little bit about each of them. Uh, we have a uh, component of the foundational research. This is to establish the uh, needed scientific foundations for development, design, test of uh, trustworthy AI. Um, we'll be going back to foundational research and talk uh, more about this. Uh, NIST, as I said, has a very broad portfolio of research going from uh, robots for advanced manufacturing uh, to material science, bioengineering, and we are working with uh, all of the scientists across NIST to advance AI as a tool to accelerate scientific discoveries and technological innovations. Um, evaluations and benchmark is, a, is our bread and butter at NIST, uh, and we, NIST has a long history of evaluating components of AI systems. Examples include NIST biometric evaluations that Mark is going to address and talk about it. Many of you have probably heard about face recognition vendor technology tests, FRBT, uh, or TREC, um, text retrieval information conferences. Uh, uh, currently, we are working with NCCOE, National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at NIST, in building a testbed for assessing AI vulnerabilities. Uh, standard, again, is our middle name, and we work with uh, standard development organizations. We develop tools and guides, uh, uh, and in the area of the AI, we're focused right now is on vocabulary, data, metrics, and testbed for AI. And also engagement uh, with uh, scientists, engineers, uh, 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 every, you know, the technical experts working in the area of artificial intelligence, but also psychologists and lawyers uh, AI is increasingly a multidisciplinary uh, area of research and we want to make sure that when we are talking about trustworthy and uh, understanding what constitutes trustworthiness, uh, uh, all voices are, uh, are being heard and everybody has a seat around the table. Um, so, um, what are we exactly trying to do? Uh, you all know that there has been many uh, different high-level principles for trustworthy AI. OECD is one that everybody is probably aware, and many countries, I believe something about 60 countries, has signed on to that. Uh, GPA, G20, um, also other entities and uh, uh, community of interest at GSA also working on principles for responsible AI. And the words trustworthy, responsible, all of this are being used, but the document, when you look at them, especially the talk going back and talking about OECD, these are all um, 
Uh, excellent document, but there are value-based statements. All of them are uh, rightly so, emphasizing the importance of human-centric, uh, respect the privacy and uh, individual rights. Uh, and there, uh, while there are many of these documents, there's also a lot of overlap among them. The challenge and opportunity for us, the tech community, is to get those value-based high-level statements and translate them into technical requirements that can be designed, developed, and be used for assessment of AI systems. So what are those technical requirements? Uh, one is uh, accuracy. Everybody wants the system to be accurate. There is a lot of uh, uh, activities going on development of more accurate systems and also uh, methods and mechanisms and ways to measure accuracy is uh, much more advanced than any other technical requirements. But beyond accuracy, it's also important to make sure that the system is secure to different uh, 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 attacks and manipulations. Many of you had seen some of these examples of, um, uh, I think the paper uh, by Microsoft a few years ago that by putting a post-it note on a stop sign, uh, the AI uh, system was confused and could not recognize it as a stop sign when the human brain can easily see the stop sign and realize that it is a, uh, see the post-it note and realize that it is a stop sign. Uh, so security is an important issue and we have uh, a research program around that. Robustness and generalizability of the uh, algorithm to the data that was not seen during the training. So how the AI system is gonna, uh, is gonna perform in operational setting, in, in the real world setting, um, um, and how closely uh, it's gonna um, follow the performance uh, that was measured during the uh, training is another uh, component of trusted worthiness of AI. We want AI to be explainable. Uh, uh, there are a lot of applications and use cases that uh, there is a need to explain uh, how the algorithm came to the prediction or the decision or the recommendation that the algorithm is putting forward. And uh, that is something that Mark is gonna talk about it more uh, a little bit today and more in another session. A bias in AI is a, a topic of interest. We have all heard and seen a lot of uh, articles and, and talks about the issue of the bias in AI, and that's another area of research at NIST. Uh, reliability, privacy, and several other are also technical requirements of AI. One of the things that we are uh, working on, uh, follow up to the workshop that we had on August 6th, is to come up with this list of technical requirements, what constitute trustworthiness, uh, and get an agreement of the community on that. Uh, it is only after we know what uh, it is, the trustworthiness, and we know what we, uh, so, so when we know what are these technical requirements, the next step is to work on the uh, vocabulary terminology and have a shared understanding of each of them. So bias or explainability, um, these are some of those words that can mean different things to different people. So uh, uh, part of our research is to uh, get the whole community uh, on, the, on a shared understanding of what we mean by bias, explainability, or even vulnerability, and what are the touch points of each of these components of trustworthiness in a AI life cycle. It is only after we know what it is that we want to measure that we can move on onto how to measure them and develop metrics and uh, measurement and, and uh, uh, procedures for assessing uh, these components of uh, or technical requirements for trustworthiness. So what we had done, I'll, uh, I thought of sharing a, uh, a quick overview of uh, happenings in summer of 2020. Uh, what I didn't put a um, put it here is that uh, we launched a uh, public-private partnership in uh, understanding what is uh, what constitutes trustworthiness. We had a workshop on August 6th, 
Uh, it was a webinar, two and a half hour, hour the uh, recording of that workshop is on our website if you want to go and look at that. And the idea was going from principle to practice, uh, to, uh, to uh, build a community working on getting this value-based uh, high-level principles, get them into uh, technical requirements that can be uh, designed, developed, and tested for AI systems. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have a, a research program uh, around bias in AI. Uh, we uh, uh, had a workshop on August 18. In the morning, uh, we uh, focused on the issue of the bias in data. And in the afternoon, the discussions were around bias in algorithms. Uh, we have been doing a literature survey and uh, again, the recording of the workshop uh, in addition to uh, the pre-read material are all on our website. Uh, we are working on a summary report of the workshop, but it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, broader of uh, just the summary report of the workshop while uh, we reflect and summarize the discussions of the workshop. Uh, it also uh, uh, give a, uh, a survey of the use of the term bias in different literature. Uh, security of AI, uh, uh, this was uh, the first research project that we uh, initiated. We put a terminology and taxonomy for uh, uh, adversarial machine learning out. Uh, it went through a, a, a round of public comment. We received a really robust set of comments and uh, we, are, uh, we adjudicated the comments and we are finalizing it and we are hoping to get it out by uh, end of uh, this calendar year. Uh, explainable AI, as I uh, mentioned, it's uh, one of those uh, uh, components of trustworthiness that we have uh, built a research program around it. And uh, I, I want to say that this is one of the uh, more difficult ones to tackle. Um, uh, what do we mean by explainability? Uh, is explainability always needed? I think the answer is no. Some of the times, you know, for example, for recommender systems that tell me which movie I want to, uh, I should watch, or I can watch based on the summary or a history of my movie watching, um, I probably don't care much about explainability. But if you are using explainability, if you are using AI in applications such as hiring or uh, a loan application, uh, uh, or even medical applications when there is a, uh, an AI algorithm decides that this is a, uh, for example, tumor in the MRI image of a brain scan, uh, then you probably or most probably need explainability. And then um, what explainability is useful? Uh, the different level of explainability for different uh, consumers, uh, if you are giving explainability to a um, technical expert versus, for example, for the example of the medical uh, imaging that I mentioned, the explanation to a um, physician, to a technician, to a uh, patient, to, a, uh, to the insurance company uh, would have different level and different... Um. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll let you, so our purpose to coming forth today was really to give an overview of what's going on at, at NIST and AI um, and give you some details about the areas of research that we're working in and hoping that we could take a deeper dive in the future um, in any of these areas. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, four areas of work that we're doing in our division. Uh, our division, the Information Access Division, has a, a very strong history in measurement evaluation and the involvement in standards for technologies that focus on human action, human behavior, and human characteristics. And these technologies are those that deal with uh, data that's in audio, text, images, and video. Um, and many of them detect, recognize, or seek to understand the information that's contained in that data. A sampling of the evaluation projects that NIST runs includes things like speech transcription, speech translation and understanding, natural language processing and in speech and search, or sorry, search and retrieval. We have some um, work in image authentications and forensics, and then a lot of work in biometrics with face recognition, fingerprint, voice, and iris recognition. And then in the video world, we do a lot with uh, person and object and event detection and recognition. All these technologies, or many of these technologies that, that are being developed through this NIST evaluation, we see as forming the essential building blocks for meaningful AI. 
And so building on this history and this expertise, we recently formalized a research thrust at NIST for AI evaluation. The goal of our AI evaluation research is to support the advancement and deployment of measured AI technologies. NIST conducts R&D of metrics and measurement methods in the emerging and existing areas of AI. And we do this for various classes of AI applications. Our goal is to public, or publish technical reports and to facilitate the measurement and standardization processes, as well as to facilitate the adoption of guides for AI technologies as they mature and they find new applications. What's interesting here is that AI system evaluation is, is very different and it subsumes the traditional evaluations of a typical machine learning algorithm. And it's also very different from the typical component evaluations that NIST has conducted in the past. But the experience gained through those many years of running those and managing those several evaluation driven research projects is paving the way now for meaningful evaluation of AI systems. Elham was just beginning to talk about um, AI explainability. Um, we started to think about it, uh, explainability in AI systems since in many ways at its core, this is a measurement science challenge. In the areas of explainable AI, we set out to st start the conversation about what it means when we claim that we want to claim that a system has the a feature of explainability. In large part, this again is a terminology and taxonomy problem. And so our current effort is to understand and document the areas of agreement and disagreement amongst the stakeholders of the AI community regarding AI terms for explainability and concepts. So to do this, as, as Elham was saying, we, we released the NIST, NIST IR. Oh, I can hear you now, Elham. Do you want to pick back up? I, sorry about this. I'm troubleshooting with, uh, oh, maybe, maybe I, sorry about this. I don't know where I'm, uh, where do you want me to pick up? If it's okay with you, I'll just go ahead and finish and talk about explainability yeah. and a few other things, then you can pick back up. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So the, the NIST IR on, on the four principles of explainable AI that we released um, was, was done in an effort, as I was saying, to, to document the areas of agreement and disagreement on these concepts and terms. In, in a nutshell, the principles paper talked about the, the principle of requiring accompanying evidence with each decision, requiring that the evidence that's presented accurately reflected the processes the system used to come to those decisions, and that make sure that the evidence was understandable or interpretable by the intended user. And the, following, and the final principle was that the evidence would only be generated under circumstances that the system was designed to operate. So we started out on a, in this area on, in an area of, used, relying on the experts uh, in biometrics, trying to develop these principles and then expanding it out to other domains. And every time we talk to new individuals, we learn something and we, we modify our, our design and concepts. So that's why the getting, into, getting the public uh, involved was so important to us. Um, we put the paper out for public comment. That period has closed and we're in the process of going through many, many comments received from industry and academia and other government agencies. Um, it will likely lead to a second release of this paper and we'll probably go through another round of public review. The timing of that is somewhat still to be de determined. Um, I do know that we are one signature away from being able to announce uh, an, an opportunity to get together and talk about some of these events. So if you're interested in, in explainable AI and these principles, um, be looking for that. We'll hope you to be able to announce a, um, an opportunity soon. Um, our goal again is when we come to agreement on a set of principles, NIST will then be able to provide some insights into the challenges of designing and measuring explainable AI systems. A, a third area, so that was AI evaluation and AI explainability. Another area that, of work that's coming out of our division, it's um, less mature than the other areas, uh, but we've began investigating from a cognitive sciences point of view, how users form their trust decisions when it comes to AI systems. And of course, here users cover a wide swath of people, developers, deployers, um, people affected by the decision, people using the decision. And, and while this starts with terminology, um, you know, what is user trust versus system trustworthiness, for example, 
I, I think that it's, um, it, again, another fruitful area that we need to go down. There are other NIST efforts that, as Elham was explaining, that measures AI system trustworthiness through the study of accuracy, reliability, security, and explainability. But the user trust program will support the widespread adoption of AI by studying how, when, and, and how much humans place trust in AI systems. It is the user or the human affected by the AI system who ultimately decides whether to risk placing their trust in the system. The purpose of this project is to understand and identify uh, end users AI trust requirements, perceptions, challenges, and understanding, and to establish some measures of user trust. Um, again, the final goal, once the, we, we, we have this all done, would be to be able to incorporate user trust uh, measurements and, and thoughts and ideas in the system design process. So we do have a paper that's going through internal review and when the when the team's, team's concepts are finished evolving, we hope to be able to release our initial thoughts on this space in the near future. And the final area that I was going to touch on very uh, briefly, I think Elham already talked about most of it, um, was AI and bias. Uh, we want AI that is free from bias. It's a crucial principle for both humans and machines um, to avoid bias and therefore prevent discrimination. As NIST works to develop AI systems that can be trusted, it's critical to develop and, and train these systems with data that is unbiased and to develop algorithms that can be explained. The purpose of this project is to understand and examine and to mitigate bias in AI systems throughout the development lifecycle. That's from conception through use. And as Elham said, we, we have a team that's been investigating bias. Uh, there was a large public um, workshop, a virtual conference at NIST held back in August. And that did bring together people from academia and industry and other government agencies. Um, and we're looking forward to a final report coming out soon. So we have teams in, in, in all four of these areas out of our division. And you know, as I said, if there's interest and, and people would like a deeper dive, we'd be happy to go into any one of them in the future. Okay, Elham, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Sure, thank you. Again, I apologize for that. So let's see where we are. So, so there, these, were, these were all of the um, building trust in AI algorithm. We also do have another research area on novel computation paradigms for AI. Um, so as, as we all know, uh, the major share of the advances in AI are due to uh, computational resources uh, and uh, GPUs and uh, availability of data. Advances in CMOS architecture uh, that have been so predict predictable for decades now are now slowing down. And while machine learning applications that are becoming increasing, increasingly popular, a theoretical basis for their success and failure remains elusive. So our, our uh, mathematicians and uh, uh, physicians at NIST are working on um, how to uh, look at a new uh, computational par paradigm uh, beyond the Boolean uh, algebra in the chips, the chips that can do some of the computations uh, and layers of the neural net within the chip, as well as uh, uh, novel uh, technologies such as spike neural net, that this is how our brain works. Uh, 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 by by connecting many nodes together without generating a lot of heat. Uh, so that's one area that we are working on a uh, new exotic hardware, but also uh, comparative analysis and benchmarking of new uh, uh, hardware and um, comparative analysis with traditional hardware. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the programs that we are doing and the new uh, research areas that we have built for Trustworthy AI, but I just want to uh, say a few words that, uh, uh, about our past work that uh, uh, the AI and machine learning uh, has been going at NIST uh, uh, for a long time, not only as a tool for uh, researchers, but also the contributions to data and evaluations. And I have two examples here. Uh, one is the data set MNIST that many of you have, may have heard about this. This is a sort of the standard test uh, uh, data set for evaluation and assessment on benchmarking of image-based uh, 
uh, deep learning algorithms and image understanding algorithms is a set of handwritten uh, characters. And Jan Lacun is, as you know, one of the fathers of the uh, deep learning. And uh, he uh, here is a quote uh, from him about the use of the MNIST. Uh, we uh, are working on, we are hoping to be able to do more of this type of open and public data for advancement of the AI technology. Uh, Mark, I'm sure, talked about the evaluations. Um, uh, and again, this is something that we have a, a history on that. Uh, I mentioned TREC, the tech uh, retrieval, the text retrieval conferences. Uh, many of you had seen the Watson that appeared at Jeopardy. Uh, you may be um, uh, excited to know that the idea of the Watson uh, was formed at one of the TREC conferences and the earlier version of that was tested at NIST. Um, so we have some history of evaluations of the components of the AI systems and we are building an end program around uh, what evaluations of the AI algorithm or AI system should look like or ought to look like. Um, few words on the coordination activities. That was also one of the pillars of the NIST program that I mentioned. Uh, uh, NIST director is a member of the AI select committee that's being chaired by, uh, by Office of Science and Technology Program, National Science Foundations, and DARPA. Uh, they basically um, come up with the strategic vision for the AI program for the whole country and administration. Um, then there is the NSTC, uh, National Science and Technology Council, uh, that is uh, 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 kind of get that vision and write the strategic, strategic planning, does the strategic planning and develop strategies for AI and uh, that get handed into uh, uh, networking and information technology uh, 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 working uh, uh, R&D and the AI inner agency working group under the uh, NIDER D. Um, and NIST has representations on uh, all of these at the AI Select Committee, at the NSTC uh, Machine Learning and AI Subcommittee. My boss chair is one of the co-chairs of the NSTC MLAI Subcommittee, and many of us uh, uh, sits and contribute to the uh, NIDER AI Interagency Working Group. In addition to that, uh, I wear the hat of the USG AI Standard Coordinator that was a uh, role under NSTC coming out of the plan that we developed in response to executive order on maintaining U.S. leadership in AI. Uh, we were tasked to develop a plan for, um, for uh, uh, federal engagement development of AI standards. I'll be talking a little bit about that in the next slide. I just want to say that one of our colleagues sits at the uh, National Security Commission on AI as a chief technical of, uh, advisor for the National Security Commission on AI. Uh, I'm sure you had seen the recommendations of the NSC AI and uh, the final recommendations and report is expected in March 2021. Uh, talking about the USG AI standard uh, coordinator, as I said, that was a role that uh, was uh, recommended in the plan that we developed as a response to the executive order. Um, and the job is to uh, outreach and connect with all known federal efforts relating to AI standard development, understand uh, what's going on, what are the needs, and uh, maybe come up with a list of the priorities and strategic uh, uh, involvement uh, in standard development. And many of you know that uh, per OMBA 119, standard development in the US is uh, bottom up, uh, private sector and industries are the, on the front, uh, forefront of the development of standards, uh, but USG and federal agencies had some role in helping in, in development of the standard. Um, and we facilitate ongoing discussions between uh, uh, private, public and private sector and look for opportunities to strengthen the leadership of US in um, standard developments, uh, including uh, 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 contributing uh, what we learn uh, from our engagement uh, and research program on bias, on explainable AI, on security of AI to the uh, standard development processes going on. Here is some of the uh, policy documents developed in 2019, uh, the AI progress report that the NIDER put out 
uh, the uh, AI research and development uh, uh, strategic planning that again neither put out and also the plan that we developed as a response to the executive order about federal engagement in development of technical standards and related tools. Uh, and we have been contributed to all three and authored the middle one. Uh, with that, I'm gonna stop. I apologize for the technical difficulties and open up the floor for questions for me or Mark. I think I stopped sharing my, doc my screen too. You can leave it up, Elham, no, no okay. problem. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please do drop them in the chat. Uh, they are here to answer anything that you might have. So um, I guess one question, Elham, to keep aware of, of various NIST efforts and activities and events happening, is there a way that, do you have a listserv and that's something that we can also share through the AI community of practice? We do have a list serve, and if you go to our website, it's at the bottom, but I will send it to you, Steve, and you can share it, and we will be most happy to, uh, uh, to share uh, our news and, and keep the engagement. Super. Thanks so much. Um, we do have a question here from Ryan. Uh, he's asking, I think you mentioned that evaluating accuracy of AI was an area with some maturity. Do you have a reference you could point us to? Um, not, not on top of my head, but I can send stuff to you, but basically the uh, false positive and false negative uh, rates uh, uh, for any of the classification systems is a, a more or less uh, uh, mature field. Uh, uh, the SC42, the uh, uh, ISO uh, subcommittee 42 that are working on the uh, standardizations of AI is also looking at that and they are uh, talking about false negative and false positive as uh, measures of the accuracy. Uh, I will be follow up with uh, uh, a link to ISO activities on uh, accuracy and some of the uh, academic papers. Uh, but Mark, if you want to, uh, to add. I think the only thing that I would add at this point is that in, in the sense of having some maturity in measuring AI system accuracy, we NIST um, have some experience in partnering with other agencies, programs that were, were in this area. Um, I also would like to say, I guess, that there are, there are nuances in evaluating an AI system, such as, um, you know, the not, not having ground truth or a golden, uh, golden reference answer to some of the, uh, the test data. And there have been methods through TREC and other um, evaluation efforts at NIST to, uh, uh, to be able to overcome those challenges. And so the, the maturity is there in, in structure and format and in infrastructure. Um, not necessarily, we don't yet have what I would love to have, which is a, a test bed of bring any type of AI system you'd like and be able to evaluate it, evaluate it in, the, in this harness. Uh, it's something that we're working towards. Great. So one thing I did want to comment on, it, it seems like a lot of people are interested in those links that you talked about. And I think folks are interested in the recording as well as these slides. So I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be following up with Mark and Alham and getting all the resources that they've been talking about. And we will send a follow-up email to our listserv with a link to the recording of the session, the slides, and all of these links that um, Alham and Mark are referencing. Of course. Well, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, of course, of course. Any other questions, please do drop them in the chat. Um, and I know that Elham, uh, Mark, uh, Krista and I, we've talked about uh, having them come back and go a little bit more deeply on any of these issues. So I suspect that will gather some interest as well, but um, uh, that is, that's, we've, we've had that discussion. Yeah, we are super grateful for that opportunity. Uh, one thing I have to mention, and I'm sure Mark also uh, talked about this, that, um, NIST, as you know, is a non-regulatory agency, and that is, uh, that has, is a very important factor in uh, how we work and um, engagement that we have with the industry, academia, the whole community, and the trust that it's there. So uh, all of our documents, all the work that we do, we 
um, we really encourage and we're grateful for the community uh, review and comment on our document to make them better. So any opportunity for engagement to hear your thought and, 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 and get, get getting your inputs and comments on our document, we are super grateful and we, uh, we look at them very carefully. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely something we can also do, Alham and Mark, going forward, is make sure that we get a message out to the AI community um, to make sure that you're getting the reach and, and visibility that you're looking for. Perfect. Happy to do that. Any other questions or? or... All right. OK, we've got one. All right, we've got a couple more coming in. So I'll take this one and then Christy, you can take the next one. But from Dirk, he's, uh, the question is, is there any existing AI overlays framework or other consumable material to support integrating the federal privacy and security within the AI solution, or within an AI solution? Right. Yeah, this is a really good, really good question. And uh, many of you may be familiar with the uh, cybersecurity framework and privacy framework. Uh, those uh, frameworks were uh, developed for um, a risk management approach for cybersecurity and privacy, um, but they were also developed with uh, some of the AI and AI applications in mind. So uh, they could be leveraged for uh, uh, cybersecurity or privacy for AI, and we we're working very closely with those teams uh, and, uh, and building on top of that. And uh, ultimately, uh, um, if we do what I talked about, figuring out what constitutes trustworthiness, come up with a shared understanding of what we're talking about or what it is that we want to measure, come up with the metrics and uh, uh, measurement and metrology for uh, uh, assessing each of those uh, technical requirements for uh, trustworthiness, uh, and then, then we can start working on a risk management approach to AI. Uh, uh, this is something that we have our eyes on and we want to work towards that. Uh, I keep talking about trustworthy and trustworthiness, but the other side of the cone is risk, right? We trustworthy, uh, accuracy is a uh, aspect of trustworthiness, errors are a risk. Um, security is an aspect of trustworthiness, uh, vulnerability is a risk. Uh, bias is a risk and the trustworthiness aspect of that is uh, uh, being objective and free from bias. Um, so um, uh, when I say that we work on um, technical requirements for what constitutes trustworthiness, another way of saying it is a taxonomy of risk. When we know the risk, when we know how the, uh, uh, we have a good understanding of how to define them, uh, uh, there are uh, metrics and measures to assess them and hopefully standards and guides on mitigating them. These are all recipes for a risk management approach to AI. Uh, while we're working towards that, uh, certainly there are um, other frameworks like cybersecurity framework and privacy framework, which are risk management approaches, cybersecurity and privacy that, uh, that uh, uh, while developed had uh, some, uh, uh, um, they had their eyes on AI and could be leveraged uh, uh, in the process of developing the risk management uh, for AI. Super. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Elham. So our next question is from Ketki. Is there any research going on to understand the cognitive impact on AI as we start including more of it in our day-to-day -day systems? So for example, how it would uh, change user workflows and their cognitive processes? So this is Mark. I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, in our division, we do have the Visualization Usability Group who focuses on the human factors of, of IT. They champion, they, they champion the human experience in IT. And this, while we don't have active work in this area, this is certainly an area of discussion of an of of area that's ripe for future involvement. And if there are people out there that are working here, and uh, we would be interested in partnering. Great. Thanks, Mark. A uh, question from Stefano. Could you talk about identity for AI and how is it secured uh, as it play it relate to trust? Anything that you're aware of? Can you clarify what you mean by identity? Is it is it uh, identifying people? Yeah, so Stefano, maybe if you get a chance to drop something in the chat or um, if you want, uh, Alex, to read allow Stefano to speak or at least to come off mute for a second. 
looks like he's talking about fake identities or my identity as Krista Kennard, right? And I log into an AI system. How are, is that being managed? Or if a fake identity logs in, is that what we're talking about, Stefano? Bots faking, okay. Yeah, so like fake people or fake things. Yeah. Um, right, so, uh, so um, and, and, and Mark can, can talk, uh, Mark, please uh, feel free to, to add to this. So we all have heard about uh, deep fakes and uh, and gener generative adversarial uh, networks that can uh, simulate um, images. They, they 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 don't necessarily, you know, technically speaking, they don't simulate images. They they build uh, the right uh, uh, probability distri probability distribution functions and then sample from them. So uh, uh, the GANs today can generate face images of the people that they don't exist, but those images look very, very real to, to our eyes, to, to human eyes. Um, um, and, uh, and that, of course, can have uh, issue and, and concern about uh, identity and how, um, for example, my face can be stolen and with, with some changes uh, being morphed into somebody else's and, and be able to um, hack to the system. So um, uh, the, uh, the topic that you're referring to goes from, uh, you know, morphing images uh, intentionally trying to break into the systems. Uh, you probably have heard about the research out of the CMU that they come up with um, eyeglasses. They can build 3D eyeglasses that people can wear and a full AI system to a known uh, identity um, and these are all uh, these are all under the uh, uh, a category of the vulnerabilities of AI systems. Uh, some of them we are trying to address as part of the secure AI uh, program, and a lot of the issues with face are also being studied as part of the face recognition research at NIST that's being done in uh, Mark's division. Great, uh, Mark. Anything to add, or or should we move on? anything is, is necessary at this point. I, again, the the goal of a lot of the work that NIST does in this space for facial recognition and understanding and, and involves the deep the, the, the image um, authentication, video authentication, is to measure technology performance, not to prescribe um, solutions. It's helpful. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up to the question that Ketki had around co uh, research going on to understand the cognitive impact of AI, uh, follow-up question is how can uh, we get involved? Any suggestions, Alham or Mark? Mark? Yeah, so as I was, I was trying to say, this, these are areas that we are discussing. People, when we talk about the strategic planning of the actual group that works in the usability and human factors area, uh, this is a topic that has come up. Um, we do work in, in AR and VR and, and also augmented reality and virtual reality. And there has been, you know, conversations about how such technology has been used to modify people, people's cognitive capabilities. And if we were going to expand into these areas, uh, we would do that if there was a need, an identified need. And um, I'm looking to get involved with others. If, if others have have an interest in this area and, and have a problem, especially a measurement science problem, um, the group would be willing, would be happy to contribute and, and collaborate. Um, we do not have, let me be clear, we do not have an active area of research in this space right now, but it's something that we've discussed. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, another question from Dan, following on to the security question, are there existing guidelines to integrate security into DevOps, in essence, a DevSecOps for AI development? Nothing that NIST has developed yet, but uh, so uh, we, a, a lot of our research, as you remember my, I think, uh, third or fourth slide was going from foundation to apply to standards to, to adoption. And um, uh, by, by foundation, we start at the terminology and taxonomy. So uh, that's a great question. Uh, NIS has not developed any of those guidance yet. And uh, on top of my head, I'm not uh, familiar or haven't heard of something, uh, something that I can mention right now about, uh, about those uh, 
there are some algorithm impact assessment uh, sort of a checklist out by uh, UK, Canada, and I, uh, AI Global, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, or even IBM, and that you may uh, look into that. Uh, if they may, they may have a section um, addressing that, uh, but they're all in terms of uh, sort of a checklist and self, uh, yep. Yep. self and I reporting, think, yeah. And we're looking to have, um, uh, I believe AI Global, that's on our list of, of events to come. So we're looking to put uh, them uh, uh, in front of the AI community practice too. Um, Chris, I think maybe you want to say something related to the DevSecOps because we're doing some uh, uh, work, but I'm not sure where you were going to go. So we did have an event recently uh, with the Dev DevOps community of practice and actually the RPA community of practice in which we talked a little bit about this concept that is now coming out called AI Ops or ML Ops. Uh, and it is starting to embed AI and machine learning in the DevOps, DevSecOps process because the development of AI solutions, right, they're, they're very iterative in nature. And so it's a little bit different how you would deploy these. Um, we can circulate that recording. It is available on our Max page. And if it's not up there, it should be. Um, we'll, we will also send that out as one of the resources that we send in the follow-up email. Uh, there was a really good question okay. of RPA. There was a question about, so these frameworks that you're building for AI and the way you're thinking about AI, is that also applicable to specifically RPA, so robotics process automation, or more broadly to different automation and technologies as they come out? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. In terms of that, so a lot of work that we're doing right now is, um, is we call them borrowing the uh, standard lingo, horizontal. So there are things that are applicable to AI regardless of the particular technology and uh, specific domain. And we understand that there is uh, a limit on how far we go, just talking about horizontal and uh, um, use case or um, uh, domain uh, agnostic, but we think it's really important to settle that foundations. Um, and after that, we uh, have started thinking about and, and, and connecting with the different communities to build verticals. So uh, you get the definition of, for example, bias and explainability, explainability that we are uh, talking about. Um, the importance of each of them and, and the, there are uh, specificity for each of these for the healthcare community versus autonomous vehicle versus for example, face recognition. Uh, so, uh, and, and now you, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, PRA that you mentioned. So uh, at this point, we are thinking about horizontal and uh, kind of uh, domain specific agnostic, yet we are thinking about um, building communities around uh, uh, verticals. I hope that answered your question. Mm. No, that's great, Alham, appreciate it. Um, Another question is, are there any decent AI or, or AI subdomain playbooks being developed, curated, and collected? The ones I've found so far are either very generic or sales proprietary solution oriented. Um, we are actually, um, Elham and Mark, maybe you are aware of some things too, but one thing we in the AI portfolio are have pulled together and we're going through the approvals uh, to push this out to the federal government is uh, a perspective on how to think about AI capability building. Um, and so this is something we are anxiously uh, looking to provide to all of you and we're hoping for a, a early in the new year uh, launch of that. So that's, that's one thing I want to make sure that uh, I, I let the community know and be aware of. Yeah, that, that, that's great. A lot of these activities are, are happening at different communities and, and I think um, events like this and bringing a different group together is really important because uh, we can all learn from each other and complement our efforts and make a uh, be more effective and efficient. Yeah. Fantastic. Chris, do you want to take John? Oh, yeah, we've got another question. It says, are there standards for transparency of training and test data uh, and AI researches, uh, researchers conflicts, conflicts of interest? So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I was I was hoping to see if there I get a chance to talk about actual data and uh, I was going to highlight the discussions about test bed to talk about data 
Um, data is really important, data characterizations, uh, documentation about what type of data was used for training. Uh, have there been any check for bias? Have there been, um, you know, the provenance of the data, the governance of the data? These are all really important. Um, you use the uh, term transparency in data, and I, uh, 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 I, I assume by that you mean that uh, sort of a documentation on uh, what data was uh, selected, how data was collected, uh, what tests has been done on data, data. Uh, the size, the characteristics of the data. Um, extremely important topic. Um, I believe IEEE had done uh, uh, some work on that. SC42, ISO uh, uh, subcommittee 42, uh, there is a data working group and they had some documents that has some relevance, not exactly at, uh, answering all of the questions. So some work has been done, but a lot more needs to be done. So that, that is my personal assessment in that, about the field but really, really important topic.